Hey, good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. Hope that you're all having a great day so far. We pray God's blessings upon you uh, this Tuesday and the rest of this week, the rest of the season of Lent, really the rest of your lives as you continue to follow Jesus and continue uh, to grow in your faith and relationship and discipleship with him. So just want to pray God's blessings upon you and hope that you're all doing well. Thanks for tuning into this devotion. If you're watching later in the day, just want to say thank you and praise God for setting the time aside to be in God's word, to continue to grow and to continue following Jesus as his children. So we're very thankful for every single one of you who's joining us and who's seeing this later. Uh, we are going to be in Mark chapter 14 today. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and uh, get it out. We're going to turn to Mark chapter 14. It seems right with kind of an early Easter this year, it seems like we're just chugging right along and there's a lot of a lot of stuff to do and a lot of things to cover. So today in our text, we find ourselves uh, at arguably one of the most important events in the Christian faith, and that is Jesus's institution of communion. Or as, you know, maybe you've grown up and you hear it called Maundy Thursday, uh, the Last Supper, Holy Communion, whatever it looks or sounds like for you, that's where we find ourselves in the text this morning. So I'm going to be in Mark chapter 14. Uh, Every other gospel, Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John, all talk about the Last Supper. So tells us it's really, really important. And we are going to start, <clears throat> in Mark's gospel, we are going to start at verse 17. So I've got my Bible here with me. We'll just go ahead and jump into the text. And, it, and when it was the evening, he came with the twelve. So that's Jesus with his disciples. And as they were reclining at the table and eating, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me who is eating with me. They began to be sorrowful and say to him one after another, is it I? Jesus, is it me? Here's what blows my mind about the love and the heart of Jesus. Jesus knows from the very beginning of his ministry. He knows from the very beginning of his life. He knows that when he calls Judas to follow him, when he calls Judas to be a disciple, he knows full well that Judas is going to be the one who betrays him. So for Jesus, this is not new information. And I think the reason that Jesus uh, tells it right here to the rest of the disciples is he says, even though I know this information, maybe previous in his ministry or as they continue to do miracles and continue to pave the way uh, and reveal the kingdom of God, the disciples don't need to know this. They don't need to, to worry about it or Jesus says, well, if I tell them now, then maybe they're not going to scheme and maybe they're not going to conspire and try to harm each other or try to, you know, play detective and figure it out. So Jesus drops a big bombshell in this really, really uh, awesome, super relational moment. And he says, one of you, one of you who's been following me for years is going to betray me. And so naturally, every disciple who doesn't betray him is like, oh, is it going to be me? If Jesus knows all things, what if it is me? And so they start, you know, they start panicking a little bit and they start asking Jesus, Jesus, is it me? Is it me? And, you know, maybe they're playing detective now. <clears throat> Let's pick it back up at verse 20. Jesus said to them, it is one of the 12, one who dipped, one who is dipping bread into the dish with me. For the son of man goes as it is written of him, but woe to the, that man by whom the son of man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. So Jesus picks it up right there. And he says, this is the one who's going to betray me. And we know from the other um, gospel accounts, we know that Judas is the one who betrays him. We know that Judas is the one who, as Jesus says, is dipping bread into the dish with me. So Judas, at this moment, Jesus says, it's going to be him. And then he pronounces a woe. And he says, woe to that person who betrays the son of man, who betrays Jesus. <laughs> it would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Pretty harsh teaching. Pretty harsh truth. Here's an important part for us to realize as Christians. If it wasn't Judas, somebody else would have betrayed him. It's a very, very strong possibility that for Jesus to accomplish his mission for Jesus to go to the cross and suffer and die for our sins in some way, shape, or form. If it wasn't Judas betraying him, 
something else would have happened within God's plan to send Jesus to that cross. So that's something that we need to uh, be mindful of. I'm not saying give Judas a pass. He betrayed Jesus. That's the worst of the worst. Right? We're not giving Judas a pass or we're not saying like, well, but okay with him. We're saying God has a plan. And in spite of the betrayal, in spite of the horrendous actions of Judas, God's still in control. God's plan is still being implemented in spite of the the betrayal, the sin of man, all these, what you and I would look at as variables, God's still the one in control. He's still the one in power, and he's the one orchestrating in this moment everything for the salvation of the world. So we need to approach this text and we need we need to approach that line carefully because we don't want it to we don't want it to cloud our understanding of scripture and we don't want it to cloud what Jesus is really trying to teach us, and that is that he is shortly going to suffer and die for all of our sins. We, we pick it back up, and now we're getting to the actual institution of the Lord's Supper. So we're going to verse 22. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they drank all of it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine again until that, until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. <clears throat> so right here, these are what we would call in our church, in our Lutheran denomination, and a lot of Christian denominations as the words of institution. Because what Jesus is doing here is he's fulfilling all the Old Testament covenants, all the Old Testament promises, as he has been doing throughout his ministry. And he's saying, now I'm instituting a new covenant. I'm instituting a new promise. I'm instituting a new binding relationship for us to enter into with Jesus. And in this new covenant, Jesus doesn't just give us bread and wine. He gives us his true body and blood. And this is where a lot of Christian denominations tend to argue because they say some will say that Jesus's body and blood is not present, that this is symbolic, that this is a, a metaphor or a simile. And some will say, no, it is. And it's only his body. It's only his blood. And so we, what we would say as Lutheran Christians is that it's both, right? Jesus is not using metaphorical language here. When Jesus says, this is my body, <clears throat> We say, okay, it is his body, even though we eat bread. So what we would say is that <clears throat> it is Jesus's body and bread, and his body is in, with, and under common elements like bread. And we would say the same thing for the cup. We would say that the cup, right, what we drink in communion is wine or grape juice, but because of the word of God, we know that it is in, that Jesus's blood is in, with, and under that wine. So... When we say, when we look at this text, is means is. It is bread. It is the body of Christ. It is wine. It is the blood of Christ. And it's, it's all of it together in a way that our human reasoning cannot fully comprehend or understand. It is, <clears throat> it is what we would call a divine mystery, which is where we get, which actually means the Latin word sacramentum means divine mystery. We're not able to fully understand it. <clears throat> but Jesus never calls us to fully understand him. He calls us to fully trust him, fully believe in him, right? That's where faith comes in, is we may not have all the answers. We may not have all the reasoning or the understanding, but Jesus still calls and makes that relationship open and available to us. And he invites us into that relationship and he invites us to trust him. He invites us to believe in him, that he is the savior of the world, that he is the savior of mankind, and that because of what he has done on the cross and what he continues to do from heaven <clears throat> and what we continue to do by and with the power of the Holy Spirit, that he is truly with us and that his kingdom is still expanding even today. And it all starts right here. It all starts in this new covenant that he institutes what you and I call Holy Communion, and the new covenant that says we are forgiven of our sin, 
that Jesus has made atonement and that he has paid the penalty for all of our sins and that we continue day by day to follow him, to trust him, as we, especially in the season of Lent, as we follow him to the cross, as we get ready to celebrate his glorious resurrection. So church, why don't we bow our heads for a word of prayer? Lord Jesus, we're so thankful uh, for your word. We're so thankful for, even if we can't fully understand everything, that you don't call us to understand. You call us to believe. You call us to trust. You call us to have faith. And Lord, we know that when you institute communion, it's for our benefit. It's for us to be connected to you in such a personal way that, that you would give us your own body and blood and that you would give us the forgiveness of all of our sins and you would give us that reminder that you have paid it all for us. And so, Lord, we pray that that your truth, the truth that is the word of God, the, our scriptures, that you would continue in your truth to reach the lost, that you would continue to change people's lives one heart and soul at a time so that everybody, so that the whole world would come to know you as Lord and Savior. We pray all this in your most holy and powerful name. And all God's people said, amen. All right, church, that's all that we got for you. Hit the share button. We want to continue to reach out and engage other people with the life-changing news of our Savior Jesus. We're going to see you back here tomorrow at 9 for our next devotion. We want to see you t tomorrow night for our Wednesday evening programming. We want to see you Thursday night for our midweek service. And we want to see you this weekend for our Sunday worship. So have a great and blessed Tuesday, and we'll see you real soon. Bye-bye.